Welcome to Trinity United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here, whether you're in person or out in the parking lot or visiting us online. We are glad you're here. And for the people inside, there is a welcome card in the pew in front of you. If you would just take that out and fill in your name. And then if you do have a prayer request, you can put that on the back. And if you have a prayer request, fold it in half and the ushers will be by, will be by in just a moment to pick those up. And then we have a few announcements for you. Our mission of the month is Operation Christmas Child. So today after church, we're going to be putting those together instead of Sunday school. So we hope that you can join us. And we want to thank you for all of your uh, contributions. That has been helpful. And also, if you have a prayer request that needs to go out to the church, you want to contact Lynn. Our quilting group meets on Thursdays. You're welcome to join them for part of the time or the whole time. And then we also have a prayer shawl ministry. So if you know somebody in need or in the hospital or needs a boost, just go ahead and let them know that the church is praying for them. Our next trustee meeting is August 9th, and that's an open meeting. You are welcome to join us for that. And then we have a uh, song request. If you have a song request for the summer, um, a hymn, just go ahead and put that up in the lobby and then we'll try to work that in. Our next food distribution is August 6th and the 20th. So if you know somebody in need, all they need to do is pull their car in and they'll fill their trunk up. Or if they don't have a vehicle, they can come in and they have special bags for walk-ins. And today we're going to suspend our Sunday school, but we're going to be putting the Operation Christmas Child. So we need a lot of help. So if if you don't come to Sunday school normally, we need your help. Uh, mentors are needed for the 22-23 school year of meeting with kids during the lunchtime and just building relationships with them, letting them know that somebody cares. So I'm going to meet at Edison on, on Thursdays from like 12 to 12.40, so that'll be really good. I'm looking forward to it. We're collecting plastic, and what the Lions Club will do is they'll put those together for benches that will go out where the um, bus stops are and then they'll put a um, trash can by. So if you'd like to donate towards that, there is a big box outside that you can add to it. Also, they are having a byway yard sale and that will be the week that we don't have Perry Help and Perry. So Brett likes to pack his life very full. And if you have items that you would like to bring in, you're welcome to do that. They're starting to collect those now. Flowers today are given in honor of Charlie for his birthday, and he wanted to celebrate his birthday for a couple weeks, so why not? <laughs> and if you would like to donate flowers for the altar, you are welcome to put your name by the pastor's office. There's a sign-up sheet. Let's worship.
Thank you, Janet. That brings you into the presence of God, doesn't it? Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving Lord, we pledge ourselves to serve you and one another in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. Keep us faithful now and always. Give us boldness to reach the lost for Christ and open their hearts to your message of forgiveness and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, would you stand and join us in singing Because He Lives? You may be seated um, boy, and invite the boys and girls to come and a couple other folks. Yesterday we had an all-day seminar at the church and I think we had about 45 to 50 people so it was a really nicely attended event. It was a little bit long for me but part of it was is that they teach us in the scripture that God in the book of James says that when somebody's sick, that the elder should come and lay hands on somebody. So I wanted uh, Marilyn to go ahead and tell your story. Oh, of what happened yesterday. Uh, it was a long day. 
but oh, okay. I was going to use my classroom voice. <laughs> uh, it was a long day, but oh my goodness, did we get a lot from it. I was disappointed that we only had five of us from our church. Seven? Seven. Yeah. Seven. Seven from our church. But um, there were people here from all over. Medina, Youngstown, Pennsylvania, that come to follow him. But my, my story that I'm to stick to <laughs> is what happened to me. Um, as you know, I have had back problems forever. And if you notice, I didn't have my cane today. He healed me. <laughs> um, it was, he asked if anybody was up had pain. Well, of course, my hand went up with a lot of others. And since I was sitting in the front row, guess who got picked? <laughs> and uh, I was the first one to, to try it. <laughs> and, and he put his hands on my shoulders, and he, he said, uh, I, I, can, I think I was in a... <laughs> in a fog or something, but he, he touched me and he says, um, heal, heal your back. He, and he would do, the first time he did it, he then said uh, to me, uh, what's your pain level now? First of all, he asked in the beginning what my pain level was, and I said it was about an eight out of 10. And um, so then after the first time, he made me move around. And I said, it's better, but it's not gone. <laughs> and he said, all right. And we did it a second time. And it went down to like a three. And then he did it again. And louder and more firm, I felt. And um, after that, I... I had no pain, and and uh, to prove that, I went home and I had my great great granddaughter Jess came to stay with me, and I would have never been able to do this. We made red beet eggs, I, and we made a big batch of uh, macaroni salad, and I, afterwards I just looked and thanked God. One of the things they also taught us is not only do we receive from God, but we're supposed to go out in the world and tell other people about Jesus Christ. So would you tell your story? Sure. Um, one of the things he said was, God heals. We pray. And some people are afraid to step out because they think they will be a failure. He says, as long as all you tell them is you're going to pray for them, you have done your part. It's God that heals. So anyways, uh, afterwards, we went and um, healed each other, basically. And there was a, a girl there that he, he had prayed for her elbows, but she still had, had pain. So... The only thing I could say is, God, I believe, help my unbelief. Please take the pain away from this girl. And afterwards, she went out, and she said, I just had to try. So she did push-ups in the parking lot. <laughs> and I thought, okay, God, <laughs> you listen. Uh, anyways, but what she wants, to <clears throat> there was a, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, we w a, a few of us went to Target, and we were walking around, and we asked people uh, if they had pain or if, if we could pray for something for them, and there was one woman, uh, she was pushing her cart, and all of a sudden, she her eyes, I knew something happened, and, and she said that her knee popped. And I said, oh, can we pray for you? And she said, oh, no, I'll be all right. And I said, okay. 
we'll just declare that when you walk out of Target, you will have no pain in your knee. We didn't touch her. We didn't really say, dear God, please. And all of a sudden, she started walking, and she started crying. Um, but it's hard to think. And, and like I said, it, it is not us. It is God. But God loves these people and will heal these people just for us asking. But we got to ask. <laughs> Just move the microphone back. There you go. <laughs> I got to he uh, heal the other Marilyn. <laughs> uh, w both Marilyn and I were there, and he was surprised that there were two Marilyns right at the same table. And he had me come up and heal Marilyn. He says, anybody can do it as long as they believe. I checked with Marilyn this morning, and Marilyn, how do you feel? I don't have anything to say. I just feel really happy. I feel really careful about really believing. <laughs> but no, he said, I asked them then, how long is this to last? And he says, as long as you believe. Well, thank you for sharing. Can you give them a hand as they head back? We'll try this a little higher. Good morning. into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for
feels like home now, doesn't it? <laughs> well, friends, we're continuing our series on the book of Acts, and we're going to look at the sixth chapter today, and we're going to focus on how the church dealt with issues and problems as the church began to expand. And what we find consistent in the disciples is their commitment to Jesus and their commitment to the church. And their whole job was to build the church. Now they knew where they wanted to go, and they were very, very creative in handling the problems. Now I thought I'd use an example of Taco Bell. A few years ago, they stumbled onto this idea of having tacos made out of ranch Doritos, and that went over really well. Uh, it sold well. And then they came up with this idea of a naked chicken taco, which I'd never heard of, and it had a little bit of critics to it. Well, you know, these apostles also dealt with some criticism, and the natural temptation is just to give up. You know, if this is going to be so hard, why even try? But even with all the trouble that they faced, these disciples didn't give up. They were committed to their cause. Now, so far in the book of Acts, we've seen the movement of the Holy Spirit. You see God adding the numbers to the church daily. There's a lot of things that are going on, and God's Spirit is just being poured out, and people are being changed. And these people are a big part of the church. The church has grown so much that they have a feeding problem. So let's read it together. In those days... When the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and they will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Now, good luck with these names. Just bear with us. Also, Philip. Kyokurus, Nicanor, Timon, Hermias, Nicholas from Antioch. You done good. A convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. Would you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. These apostles are committed to growing the, the church. Now, they have a lot of responsibilities that go with running a church, but what we learn is that they have a commitment and a willingness to solve problems. So here there is a complaint against the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebrew Jews. Their widows were being neglected in this food distribution. Now that would be a problem. Tell your neighbor that's a problem. Now what I have discovered, if you live long enough, if you're married and long enough, if you have children, there is a very high probability that sometimes you are going to experience a problem. Amen? I mean, that's just how life works. So let me give you a background. The Hellenistic people are Jews. They're native to the Greco-Roman world, and they spoke Greek. The Hebrews were natives of Palestine, and they spoke Hebrew. So there are people all in this region that are finding faith in God. They're coming together. They have a ministry like Perry Helping Perry because just like our church, the whole person matters to the church. And in the middle of this food dis distribution, a problem arises. It's a problem of favoritism. One group seems to be getting more than the other group. This causes an issue. Now the leaders see this problem. 
and they tackle the problem head on. They don't hide their heads in the sand. They don't act like this problem is going to go away, but they deal with the problem. There was a man named Herman Olsen and his wife Donna, they had bought this farm, and they lived in Nebraska, and this farm existed in a very small community, and it was located near a creek, and just like they're experiencing down in Kentucky, this creek began flooding, and it flooded their farm. Now, they had to come up with a plan because this excess of water was affecting all of the, the livestock. So they came up with an idea of how they could divert the water if it ever rose again. But they faced the problem and, and hit it head on so that the flooding would stop before the next time or that they wouldn't have any flooding. You know, friends, we also have a problem in our world today. People are moving in a direction away from Christ. I don't know, have you noticed that? But we have an opportunity as followers of Christ to make a difference. But you know, none of us individually are as smart of, as, or as strong as all of us collectively. We have the opportunity to reach people in our community for Christ, amen? And one of the ways that we do that is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing that we learn from this passage is that you need to surround yourself with the right people because that would help your commitment level. So they said, pick from yourselves seven men that are filled with the spirit, that are filled with wisdom, who we can appoint for this duty. Now, from this, we can see that there are people around you that are fun to be with, and then there's some other people that we know that are drain battery drainers or, you know, some people charge our batteries and some don't. <laughs> I had read about a, a man that had trouble with his wife and he was talking to a friend and he said, you know, we have this beautiful daughter and she's named after her mother and she says, my daughter's birthday is tomorrow. And his friend's like, wow, that's really nice. How old will she be? He's like, well, she's going to be five. But man, her mother is one of those aggressive psychos. <laughs> you know, from the description, you get the idea that this wife is a battery drainer, amen? Probably not the type of person you want to be around. You want to find people that can build your God-given dream. People that help find your God-given goal. They can make you be the best you that you can be. So how do you look for people that do that? First, it's people that inspire you by your example. Now, I have a pastor friend named Brenda Young that she's semi-retired now, but I always follow her on social media, and she always sees the best in other people. She's always quoting different people that have, she's gone to seminars or read their books, and she's very deeply involved with their family. She's always building them up and lifting them up. And I noticed that she never gets involved in these topics that polarize people. And she inspires me. So my question that I want to ask you is, where do you want to go in life? Because your goals are going to determine your mentors. Your goals are going to determine who you select to surround yourself with. These are people that are going to help you with your goals. Now, I tend to learn by, by example, so everything I learn in life seems to be by watching other people. Now, how else do you select people? Another group is people that can coach you. Coaches help you go where you want to go in life. They can have coaches for your family. You can have a coach at work. But God would put people in your life that can help you. And you know what? We could use coaches in all kinds of different areas. Now, the third group that you want to surround yourself with is people that share your dream. Now, these people could be called partners. They partner with you in whatever dream or goals you have. You may have a dream for a cause or a purpose. So if you really want to devote yourself to one thing, you have to have others that share that goal with you. Now, the fourth group that you want to surround yourself with are people that love and pray for you. These people, hopefully, you call your friends. 
They're the people that walk in when everybody else walks out. We need a few friends to help us through. Now, your best friend should make you be the best that you can be. There's a lady named Liz Wiseman, and she has written a book called Diminishers and Multipliers. I actually think it's called Multipliers. And she said, multipliers are these people that believe in you. They cause you to be smarter than you thought you could be and cause you to dream and think thoughts that you never thought you could have, that never thought were possible. And as an example of this, she gave Steven Spielberg, because if you ever watch his movies, they seem to be just top notch, that he develops these teams and he helps them to be the best that they can be. He believes in the teams and brings the very best out of them. So I would challenge you to examine the people that you put around you. And this is what 1 Corinthians says. Would you read it with me? For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Each person in here gives a little bit to the cause to make a difference in the world. Our goal is is to share the gospel with others, to reach out and help other people. That's so important. So why do we need all these people in our lives? One is to make up for our weaknesses, because believe it or not, I know it's hard to believe that each of us has some weaknesses. You know, in high school, believe it or not, I played field hockey, and I played on defense because I'm not a runner. One year I played a halfback, then a fullback, and then I was a sweeper. Now, I could stop the ball and I could get it midfield, but I didn't have the running strength to make the goals. So my strength was in defense, and I needed other people in offense to help me in my weaker areas. Now, in ministry, I need Janet to play the organ and piano. Believe me, you do not want me over there. <laughs> Those are her gifts. I need Rindy or, or to put the services online. Those are her areas of strength. I need ushers and greeters and other people because one person can't do everything. God intentionally gives us strengths and weaknesses, and we need each other. And our gifts are what brings us together. So if you can dream your dream yourself, I would say your dream isn't big enough. This is what Romans says. You and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Your faith is going to help me, and at some times my faith is going to help you, help you. So it's really important that we surround ourselves with people that build our faith up rather than tear it down. You need to bring, be, surround yourself with people that bring out the best in you. You know, you may be the best singer, but you need somebody to take you to the next level. In fact, statistics say that when people get a coach, they get 90% better at their craft than those without a coach. Well, you know, the, the Bible tells us, and we, we've used this scripture before, Proverbs 27, iron sharpens iron, friends sharpen and shape each other. Having the proper friend is important because partners help you, encourage you to get a job done. They make a difference. Tell your neighbor, they make a difference. We also need people to surround us to help us up when we fall. Even though you may have a God-given dream, we're going to make some mistakes getting there. And we're going to have some mistakes in catching the vision. This is what James says. Would you read it with me? We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. And Ecclesiastes says this, would you read it with me? If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. When people marry, they have this vision to help their partner, to help their children. And then the enemy tends to attack marriages. So to combat this enemy, we need to pray for one another. And we need to find ways to build each other up because there's too many people trying to tear us down in the world. And then finally, we need to surround ourselves that help us to resist attacks and critics. Well, why? Because the moment you choose a dream or a goal, the moment that you step out, 
Somebody isn't going to like what you do. I had somebody come to me this week about this seminar we were having, and they're like, is this going to be like Ernest Angley? Are you going to pop people on the head and have them fall down? And I said, no. <laughs> Marilyn, did they pop you in the head? <laughs> so, you know, we need people, but I'm glad they asked those questions. You know, in the book of Acts, we've seen the apostles get criticized over and over again. And no matter who you are in life, you're going to be criticized by somebody. Somebody is going to come against you. So I want to surround myself with people that believe and that matter to God. I want to be surrounded with people that build up the kingdom of God. And you know what? There's going to be some people that don't like that. Ecclesiastes reminds us, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Friends, it's important that we surround ourselves with the, the right people. We don't want to walk this Christian faith alone. We want to walk it with other people. The next thing that we learn is that commitment involves keeping your calling. The apostles built this team to help with food distribution, and that allowed them to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's why here, Brett Huntsman and his wife run our food pantry. They have that gift and ability, and they do it really well. And then all the rest of us can do our gifts and our talents and our abilities. Hebrews 12 says this, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. You know, when we understand God's grace, when we understand that we're all broken people, and we understand that everyone makes mistakes and that Jesus is the one that paid the price for us, I think then we'll reach out to other people when they make mistakes. Our grace will cover those people. Because when bitterness takes root in your heart, then you tend to pollute other people. I wonder, have you ever been around somebody that's bitter? You know, and all they do is they seem to pollute everything they're around. But we want to make sure that nobody misses out on God's grace. Because it says those who have been forgiven much will forgive other people. You know, if our lives are led by God's grace... And if God has surrounded me with people who can make up for my weaknesses, you know, if I can have somebody that is good at administration and details, or if I tend to be an introvert, there are people that make up those weaknesses by greeting other people. You know, like I tend to be very task-oriented. I like to accomplish things, and sometimes I focus on what I have to get done, and I can just walk into the office and forget to say hi to Sheila. And then I'll have to come back over and say, good morning. <laughs> You know, but it takes for me intentionality on my part to just slow down and spend time with people. Romans reminds us of this. He says, we all have different gifts according to the grace that God has given to each of us. And he says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in according to your faith. If it's serving, serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's in giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then do so diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. The verse is saying, in all that we do, do all that you can. If you're serving the Lord, be all in. You might be asking, well, how can we know our calling?" Well, you know what? To find out what you're supposed to do involves sometimes knowing what you're not supposed to do. So I would say don't be afraid to try a new ministry or be afraid to fail at a ministry or a service. Commitment includes seeking God for spiritual insight. When the apostles asked the group to select seven men to distribute food, this pleased the whole gathering. Now, how often in the church do we please a whole gathering? That's kind of miraculous, isn't it? Well, you know, here's what I've learned over the years. I think every single person is a leader. And leaders understand noise in their business. 
leaders kind of develop this sonar for listening to sounds early that something is amiss. Now, I was really happy yesterday because one of the kids had spilt something all over the table, and Vicki Ryan caught it right away and ran over there with a towel and cleaned it all up. You know, she was really aware of her surroundings that one needed to be done. You know, healthy mothers are experts at this. You know, sometimes a mom doesn't hear anything from the children, and they automatically know, you know what, something isn't right here. And one mom walked in into her son's room and found him covered in Vaseline from head to toe. You know, it's a good thing she listened to those little whispers and, on, and was discontent. You know what, something isn't right here. You know, leaders in an organization can t detect the same thing. These apostles were committed to a cause. They were committed to figuring out how to solve problems. And the apostles moved towards that noise rather than away from it. They didn't avoid it. They realized that this problem with food distribution wasn't going to go away. Now, a couple years ago, you may have remembered the problem that Chipotle had. You know, people were getting sick after they ate the Chipotle food. And these Chipotle leaders initially got together, they coded the problem, and they said, you know what, this is a yellow. So they tried to clean a few things up and tried to move on. But then people were getting E. coli and other illnesses, so these leaders came together again and they coded this a red problem. They ended up closing the restaurants and cleaning everything, and they came back even stronger. So they saw a problem, they attacked the problem, and they had a solution for it. And then they put a plan together. Well, because each of us leads, we lead somebody. Maybe it's your children, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's a whole group of people. So the question we have to ask is, do you do this when you lead? Do you hear about a problem or sense a problem, and do you move toward it? Do you address that issue as quickly as you can? Or do you avoid it? Do you just let it go? These leaders in the early church, they addressed the problem right away. They heard about this problem and they went after it. They were looking for people to get to the root of the issue. Now, they didn't take anyone that, that, that had specific qualifications. They said, you know what, it has to be a believer. And it has to be evident. And it has to be somebody with wisdom and, and somebody that has people skills. You know, sometimes when it comes down to leadership, we have to lead ourselves. That's where leadership begins. So my question is, what is the biggest problem that you're facing right now? Now, some people can identify that immediately. Other people just kind of accept their problem and live with it. But if you can identify your problem, I wonder, do you have an action plan? Is there some plan that you're going to work on and do something about that? You know, I meet some people that are dealing with the same problem that they had 30 years ago, and they never developed a plan to do something about their trouble. Isn't that heartbreaking? Tell your neighbor that's heartbreaking. Don't let that happen to your one and only life. Don't let one problem define you. Don't carry that problem around. Come up with a plan. Don't let one besetting problem destroy your one and only shot of making a difference in the world. I think if Acts 6 teaches us anything, it jolts us back to this fundal, fundamental belief that problems need to be named, they need to be coded, and there needs to be some type of action plan filled with prayer where we're inviting the Holy Spirit into our life so that we can make a difference. And we just need to ask the Holy Spirit to do a supernatural work in your life that draws us closer to Jesus. And I would say do that before this problem defeats you or brings you down. Friends, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are all in this together. We don't want to waste our lives pleasing people that don't care about godly things. We want to please you. We want your favor to rest over our lives. And Lord, help us to live with integrity and humility and generosity. 
Help us to surround ourselves with people that bring out our God-given calling, even if it's hard. Help us to live with people who love you and serve you, who help us to become better every day. Lord, take over every area of our lives, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. When that day comes And I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever, forever worship you I can only imagine To my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, I can only imagine, I can only imagine. To my knees will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak it all, I can only imagine. Thank you, Josie. Friends, we come to our time where we share our joys and concerns, so would you be in an attitude of prayer? Dear gracious Lord, we just lift up a family in Kentucky that were affected by the flooding. We just ask that they're able to find a safe and dry spot to live and that they're able to get their home back and that they're able to have the help that they need to rebuild if they need to and that you provide all of their needs for them. We also ask that you continue to lift up the church and help with flood buckets and things of that nature so that we can help them out. We also lift up Randy Benedict that passed away on Wednesday with his family. We just ask that you help them through the grief of the 
just the denial and the anger and the, um, uh, the just the pain that they're feeling at this point and just the shock. And we just ask that again, people would surround them and help them in practical ways. We also lift up John Cassidy that's having heart valve surgery on Wednesday. We just ask for um, you to touch the doctor's hands and their instruments that you would guide them and that everything would go as very routinely and that he's able to be back and, and recovered quickly and restored and that you would heal him from his head to his toe. We ask this in your name. And we also lift up all of those. I think we have about eight or nine people that are still getting over COVID. So we thank you for those that have recovered. And we're just asking that you continue to help researchers to be able to f develop a, a antidote for all of this so that people don't get as sick. Lord, we lift up those in Ukraine. And we just ask that you continue to bless those that have lost loved ones or have been displaced, that you allow them to find shelter and people that care for them and love them and that their kids get the education that they need. And as they've lost jobs and things of that nature, that you would provide them with all that they need. Would you join me in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we're coming to our time where we give back to God and just know that our church this week was able to outreach people and go out into different stores, whether my group went out to, um, uh, where did we go? We went out to Walmart, some of them went to Target, some went to Dollar Tree, and then we were able to pray for people and let them know that God loves them. So as you give, know that we are making a difference. The chimes of time ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell, was that someone you? You may have won or added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened, for I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. What God can do. There is no night, for in His light you'll never walk alone. Always feel at home, wherever you may roam. There is no power can conquer you. While God is on your side, just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for us. 
he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Let's pray. Dear Gracious Lord, we thank you for these gifts and these givers, and we would ask that you would help us to multiply them so that we're able to make new disciples for the transformation of the world. We lift up all of those that were at the seminar, and we ask that you give them strength and boldness and tenderness that we're able to go out and reach others for Jesus Christ. And we ask this all in your name. Amen. Would you remain standing and join me in singing, Take My Life and Let It Be.
friends, may you go out this week and make you make a difference in someone's life. You may be seated. <clears throat>